Hey, Flower Tribe. <laughs> it's Kelly Lehman from Cranberry Fields Flower Farm. And today I want to talk to you guys about hydrangea care in spring. So I know uh, the weather is starting to warm up, temps are getting nicer outside, um, and we're really excited to go out there and start taking care of our gardens, especially our hydrangeas. Uh, but I just want to caution you, you might want to hold off on the pruning, especially on your hydrangeas that come in on old wood. And I'm going to kind of explain all of that today. So um, before we get started, if we haven't met yet, it's nice to meet you. My name is Kelly Lehman. I'm the owner of Cranberry Fields Flower Farm here in Cranberry, New Jersey. And I love giving you guys fun free flower tips. So please feel free to subscribe to this YouTube channel and hit the bell notification so whenever I post another fun free flower tip video. So um, I started a Facebook group for you guys. Some of you have asked me if there was a place where you can post your own garden pictures and your own flower pictures and where you can uh, ask questions and talk to other gardeners. And so I started a Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe Facebook group. So please hop on over there. Uh, it's a really fun place to go. There's tons of gardeners from all around the world and they're posting their pictures and they're asking questions and they're answering each other's questions, which is so terrific because you guys have like such a shared wealth of knowledge from all over the world. And it's so nice to see uh, you guys helping our family, our, our flower family together. So um, I wanna give a special shout out to Agnes who's on our group page and she posts these super funny uh, like like garden memes and there was a really funny one that she put up there It has like a dog and this giant pile of mulch and his like half of his body's in half of his body's out And Sheldon and I were looking at it yesterday. We're like, oh my god like, What is this picture of and then we looked at it and we read it and it's it's very funny So actually Agnes, I'm gonna try to find you on our Facebook group today And I want to send you some sunflower seeds because you've been doing a lot of really funny uh, Posts on there. So every now and then I like to send out some of our uh, free sunflowers to some of our flower tribe members that are, you know, like really active and really contributing and, and, and helping each other out. So thank you for that. And uh, when you guys hop on today, let me know where you're viewing this from. I love to see which part of the world you're from and if you have any garden questions. And I'll try to answer some of your questions today during our live. And um, if I can, I'll try to catch up with you later. You can always put comments uh, below later on. So some people are signing on. Hey, Margaret, Norman, how are you? Oh, Michigan. Oh, uh, go blue. My daughter uh, went to Michigan. And we've got Frank. Hey, Frank, how are you? From Detroit. Oh, another one from Michigan. Uh, Oh, you got snow today, amazing. I have to say it's cold here in New Jersey today. It was super warm like last week and then we got the spring zonk. So I'm, I'm actually in a t-shirt now, but I had a sweatshirt on all day and I was outside uh, in the secret garden with Lucy before collecting just some little props for today. And it was raining and wet and it's pretty miserable here. So um, yeah, so you have snow there too. Diane, hi from Indiana. Oh, hey. Uh, Diane from Indiana, my friend Susan Mavoides is from Indiana. Do you know each other? I love when people say that, like you say, I'm from New York. Oh, I have a friend in New York. Do you know them? <laughs> so listen, you never know. Uh, and we've got um, Margarita Clayton, Brookville, Ontario, Canada. Oh, hey, thanks for joining us. And Diane, your hydrangeas budding. Oh, interesting. Okay, super. Okay, let's get into it, Diane. Super question. Thank you for that. Diane says, my hydrangea is budding. Uh, it might freeze tonight. Should I cover it? So I'm happy I have my little props here. So I think, Diane, what you're talking about is you're seeing this on your hydrangea. You're seeing these buds that came up. So these are buds. Uh, that are most likely on like either an endless summer or a Nico hydrangea. And if it's going to freeze tonight and, you know, be like a really like a good freeze. Yeah. You might want to do something to this hydrangea that will save these fresh young buds. Cause these are going to be your flowers that are going to come up in a few months. But if they get something, um, people call it all different things. I call it winter zap. If you get those super cold temps that come in and they kind of linger, what's going to happen is this fresh, green, delicate, new, you know, growth is going to freeze off. And then what happens is it turns kind of brown. Like it kind of looks like this and then you don't get any buds. So what you could do is you can put some uh, like steaks, either like bamboo shoots. You can get these at like your garden centers. You can get them at Home Depot. You can get them at Lowe's. You put like some wooden poles, maybe like, I don't know. Well, if you're, if your hydrangea bush is like, you know, three foot tall, get them a little bit, you know, taller and you can, put them in the ground around that plant, and then you can wrap burlap around it. And if you don't have burlap, uh, some people wind up um, putting like chicken wire around it, which I guess your chances of finding burlap might be easier than chicken wire, but chicken wire you can probably 
also find at um, like Lowe's. But what they'll do is they'll secure either the chicken wire or they'll secure their burlap wrap. Some people even use old sheets and you can use that as a protection against those elements uh, just until it warms up again. And some people like when they use the chicken wire, they'll surround it with the chicken wire and they'll stuff leaves like, you know, like, like leaves that were from fall that are like all over your garden now, they'll insert them inside uh, so that it's one more layer of protection. But if you just have that fabric around it, that should be fine. Or that burlap wrap, that should be fine too. I think some gardeners, and let me know what you guys think. Do some people just put like, uh, like giant, like hefty bags around them. I don't know that I've ever seen anybody do that, but as we're talking, I'm like, like, why not, why not try that? And so that should protect them, but just be super careful because this time of year is like so volatile. So it's like going to be super cold by you tonight, Diane, but then tomorrow it might warm up to 50 or 60. So you want to make sure that you don't have that burlap wrap and you don't have like that fabric around your plant when it heats up again, because then it's going to cause all sorts of like moisture issues and fungal issues. If you have all that heat trapped in there, then what's going to happen is you're going to wind up getting like all sorts of like wetness issues on these buds. And then they're going to snap off, uh, you know, for like a different reason. So that was a super question. So thanks for that. Wow. Right out of the gate. I love you guys. <laughs> You're awesome. Okay. Oh, yeah. so Diane said it's an endless summer. Okay. So I guess while we're talking about endless summer, let me just go into, um, endless summer is like one of the, the favorite hydrangeas that people grow. It's like, I, I have, um, so many videos on my endless summer hydrangea. And the story with endless summer hydrangea is you don't want to prune it this time of year. Because right now, this, like I said, this branch came from my endless summer and these little buds were put in place last fall. And this was put in place on what's called old wood. So if I went out to my endless summer today and I kind of trimmed back this branch or I trimmed back like two or three feet, every single one of these little green buds is going to be a flower. I would be cutting off all those flowers that are supposed to come in in the beginning of summer. So it's a really good idea to, you know, to, to lay off on the pruning, especially if you don't know which hydrangea you have. Now, if you're watching this and you're like, oh, this is the worst. I just went out and pruned my endless summer. Don't worry. Endless summer is awesome because they give you a second burst of blooms at the end of summer on new growth that comes in from the bottom of the plant. So it's like a, or a, like a, it blooms all summer long. So don't worry about that. It's not a big deal. And I have to say, guys, in gardening, very few things are like a really big deal. Like, you know, if you make a mistake, nature's great. Your plants want to live. So even if you like blow it this season, you have next season. And so, you know, don't worry about it. Uh, if you have a Nico hydrangea, however, no Nico hydrangeas are those beautiful, like blue poofy ones that you would find in like your grandmother's garden. Uh, those come in only on the old wood. So if you prune those back by accident, like this time of year or in winter, then you really cut off the entire season's worth of blooms. Most of the time, sometimes you might be lucky. You might see, you know, some blooms that you might've missed. So if you did that already, don't worry because there's always good news. There's always a silver lining. If you already cut back your hydrangeas that come in on that old wood, you just gave your plant a recharge, which is like really great news because sometimes our hydrangeas need like just like a recharge. They need you to kind of prune them back to give them a kickstart to bloom profusely again. So I have a few uh, Nico hydrangeas here and I have a ton of endless summer and every like, I don't know, like on year five or year six, even though I know I'm not supposed to prune them back because they're going to miss out on uh, those blooms in the beginning of summer, I will cut them back because they might not be performing as well as they used to. And when you give them that, you know, that, that, you know, pruning to about, I, I usually do to about two or three feet, it kind of just stimulates the plant to like give it, you know, more uh, stronger roots and stronger leaves. And it kind of just builds up the plants because it doesn't have to worry about forming flowers that season. So you're helping the plant to get like super strong. And then your next season, they're going to be like twice as beautiful. So don't worry. So that's kind of like the good news with the old growth and uh, the new growth. But I'm going to tell you also about uh, hydrangeas that come in on only new growth, like your limelights uh, and your Annabelles and your Invincibles. So um, I'm going to tell you about that in like two minutes. Let me just see who else is here today. Uh, hey, Victor. Oh, you're from Stewartville, New Jersey. You're close by. Jersey guy. Nice to see you or nice to hear you. <laughs> Diane, you're very welcome. 
uh, Nanie from West Windsor, New Jersey. Nanny Lee, I used, that's very funny. I used to live in West Windsor next to a family called Mr. Well, they were, I called them Mr. and Mrs. Lee, um, <laughs> but they've since moved. And that was probably about 10 years ago. So yeah, you're right next door. Nice to see you. Uh, Alicia Smith, you're from Fayetteville, Arkansas. Oh, nice to see you. Claudette, hello from Fort Worth. Beautiful day here. Nice. Nice to see that. And Sharon, Redfoot, Tennessee. All right. Terrific. Well, thanks guys for checking in. I love that. You know, I don't know. That's just like my thing. I love seeing where you guys are from and I appreciate that. And if you head over to our, uh, flat or Kelly Lehman's flower, try Facebook group, please always pop in and just say, you know, Hey, you know, Diane from, you know, blah, blah, West Windsor. And, and, you know, here's my garden question, or, you know, here's an answer for, you know, Amy from above. So, cause it's really fun to, to do it that way. And we've got Linda, uh, from Home and Garden. Good morning from California. Oh, nice. All right. Uh, England. Wow. Lindsay, Noel from across the pond. Nice to see you. Okay. So let's get back to these hydrangeas. So I did my little field trip this morning uh, with Lucy and we got some of our props here. This is from my uh, limelight hydrangea. So guys, any time of year, it's okay to do like a deadheading. So what I mean by deadheading and deadheading is very different than pruning. So you can deadhead your hydrangeas any time of the year without really harming the plant. And that simply means you're gonna cut off uh, like right beneath the flower. And uh, you can also, most times of the year, also just you know cut it like, I don't know, like a little bit, maybe like six or inches or 10 inches. If you wanna make a bouquet, uh, a lot of questions that came up were, oh, I wanna make a bouquet from my hydrangeas, but I, I don't wanna prune it and then not have it bloom. So here's the thing, you can deadhead, like I said, underneath the flower anytime you want, or cut like a six or eight inch you know, piece of stem on, on most hydrangeas and make a bouquet. And uh, it's still not really considered like, like a harsh pruning by any means. So I cut this whole shenanigans off of uh, the limelight because these branches were like, I think the branches are like 10, 15 feet tall. They're tremendous. This, this, this bush is like tremendous. So I cut this off. Limelight hydrangeas, their blossoms come in on what's called new growth. So anything that's coming in that's going to be a flower is kind of starting to form now. So this is the beauty of getting these hydrangeas that come in on that new growth because uh, the Winter zap that we talked about with Diane before is not going to affect them because their buds aren't even going to show up for like another couple of weeks. So if we get those really sharp, you know, temperature decreases uh, in like March or even in April, those buds are still like inside the plant. They didn't quite emerge yet. So it's not going to have winter zap and it's not going to, you know, freeze off all those flowers. And once again, if you like pruned them back in, like fall or winter or like, you know, early spring, you pruned it back. It doesn't matter. Like if you gave it even like a harsh pruning or like, you know, if you took like a third of the plants off now or even like next week or the following week, you're still going to get like gorgeous, gorgeous, gorgeous blooms on your limelight and your Annabelle and your Incredible. So that's the beauty of, of planting hydrangeas that come in on new growth. And when you go to like your garden center, you can ask, you know, like the garden person, you can say, hey, you know, uh, I, I want like a, a no fuss uh, plant that I don't have to worry about, you know, fussing with the pruning. And and you could say, I want something that comes in on, on new growth because now you have all these little, you know, like gardener terms in your pocket and, you know, they can steer you to those. But I do have to say, I am madly in love with Endless Summer. And the rule of thumb at, at, here at the flower farm, mostly because I'm super lazy, is that I don't prune them back hardly at all. Like I said, if I prune back my endless summer, like every five years, like that's a big deal. I leave them alone because for the most part, they bloom like profusely. And like, I've got um, a video, it's called how to get more blooms from your hydrangea. You're going to see like, I've got like this hedgerow of hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of these giant blue blooms and they're spectacular. And I literally neglect the heck out of these gals. I mean, I put them in the ground like 10, 15, probably about 10 years ago. And, you know, it took a while for them to get established. Uh, don't be, don't be um, too upset if you put a hydrangea in the ground like a year or two ago and it's still like, wah, wah, like it doesn't really look that great. It's okay because they take a while to kind of start showing off. But these gals started showing off after like, you know, like year three or four or five. And they're like just this mountain of massive, massive blue hydrangeas. 
and I don't prune them back. Like I hardly ever prune them back. I, I hardly ever fertilize them. I'll give them some mulch. I make sure that I'm good with the water. Always water at the base. If you guys are just getting into the hydrangea game, don't overhead water because that can cause fungal issues, especially if you overhead water your hydrangeas like in the afternoon because those nighttime temperatures drop. And a lot of times it will cause like all those ugly brown spots on the leaves. And uh, sometimes it can be an issue for plants. So always deep root water your hydrangeas and most of your plants, which just means like you take your hose and you know you, you kind of hold it by the base for a couple minutes, you know, like a few times a week or like once a week, depending on like what your weather conditions on, it depends on like where you live. Someone in South Africa is gonna do it much differently than someone in England. So, uh, yeah. So anyway, that's the watering thing. So sorry for going off on that little tangent here. Let me see what's going on here. Uh, checking in from Rhode Island. Okay. I'm hoping the hubby covers my hydrangeas in Northern Jersey. Oh, that, that's a good hubby. I have to say Sheldon would do something like that for me. I'd be like, oh, I forgot to cover the hydrangeas. And he'd be like, oh, like, what do you want? <laughs> well, like, what do I need to do? Because I know you're going to nag me for it later. So that's great. It's good to have the helping spouses there. Um, let's see. It, they do look beautiful, Diane. Thank you. Let's see, Michigan. So yeah, so okay, so that's the, the limelight story. And then the same thing with, um, who else did I have here? I've got my endless summer. Oh, I wanted to show you this guy. Who is this from? Oh, okay, so here's the thing. Your Nico hydrangeas, uh, this is from like a Nico hydrangea bush. And any of your hydrangeas, the same thing goes for like the deadheading as cutting out those dead stalks. So a lot of times you'll see like those stalks that are kind of in the middle and you just know that there's nothing growing on them, especially if you're looking at some of these little stalks that are, um, I thought I had like a really, really super dead one. Oh, I do. I'm, like, I'm sitting on it. I have a chair with all my props on top of me. If you have like one of these canes that are in your hydrangea bush and it's like white, I hope you guys can see this. If it's white, you know, like on the top and you cut down a couple inches and it's still white, chances are that's what's considered a dead stalk. And you can just, or a dead cane, you can cut those out at any time. So you can cut them out now, you can cut them out in winter, you can cut them out in summer. Uh, but a lot of people will hold off on this kind of like light pruning until they know for sure. Because at this time of year, some of these um, hydrangeas that look like they're dead. These, these canes aren't really dead. They're just still dormant. So here's what happened to me this morning. I love showing you guys my blunders because I make so many every week. I'm always like, oh, this is just great material for the flower tribe because I, I blew it again. So today I went out there and I went to try to cut off some of the dead, some dead heading and some of the dead stalks from my Nico. And I noticed that like these guys here look very brown and you can tell that these little buds are super brown and they look nothing like my endless summer ones. The endless summer ones are nice and lush and green. So, you know, in my head, I'm saying, well, this must be a dead stalk. These must have had, you know, winter zap. They froze off and they're not going to bloom. And it looks like this entire stalk is pretty dead. So I'm going to cut it out. So I go and I cut it out. And when I cut it, I realize that the bottom of it has a lot of green. Like I know it's hard to tell on this. I'm holding it in front of a computer, which is not good, but this has a lot of green inside. So I'm like, uh oh, <laughs> is this not really a dead stalk? And sure enough, and I should have did this before I cut it, I kind of peeled back like part of this. I know this is not the, not the best visual I'm giving you, but hold on a sec. Bear with me, Flower Tribe. I'm trying to figure out the technology part of this, <laughs> this world. If I peel back some of the brown, I start to notice that there's green on here after all. So there was just like a little protection over here. And this would have actually probably have, have been a flower if I didn't get my big fat hands in on it. So I shouldn't have cut this out. I should have just deadheaded this guy. I should have left this cane intact because I would have had like one, two, three, <laughs> I would have had like three or four giant Nico hydrangeas. So a lot of people will suggest that when you go out into your garden to do kind of like that hydrangea cleanup, even though you now know not to prune back your Nico hydrangeas and you know not to prune back your endless summer, you could go in there and remove those stalks that are dead and you can deadhead. But a lot of people say, wait until May. And if you wait until May, then at that point, this guy that I thought was dead is going to be a lot fatter and chubbier and greener. And it would have been a lot more obvious to me not to do this and not to cut out my fresh blooms like I, like I did this morning, like a big dummy. So um, so that's the story with that. So a lot of people say, wait until May. You can kind of go in and do like a little cleanup, a little shaping. 
but hold off on the harsh pruning. So that's the story. And if you don't know which hydrangea you have, um, I think more people don't know what hydrangeas they have than do, and that's okay. Don't prune them back. You know, let them go. Let them go for a season. And now that you're kind of onto them and you want to learn more about them, let them bloom this season. And then, guys, Google's like so fun and amazing. I mentioned if, like we had this when we were kids. Like you could type in, you know, uh, white fluffy hydrangea, and then. Pfft, like you have like 25 different pictures that pop up and they tell you about it. And uh, yeah, so like when we were kids, we were like doing the microfiche <laughs> like in the library and, you know, putting the dimes with the encyclopedia, like, you know, photocopying the pages to get information. You can get information so easily now, especially about garden care. And I'm actually going to be testing out an app for a company um, with this month, that's like a, like a garden, uh, a plant identifier. So I'm really excited about that. They're sending me the information next week. I'm super excited. Uh, I, I tested it out. It's really fun. And you kind of just like hold it onto the plant and then boom, it tells you what it is and all about it. So, but you know, since we don't have that, I don't have that just yet to, to show you guys, just Google it, do a Google search, you know, hydrangeas, blue, fluffy and then it will tell you which kind of hydrangea you have and then you'll know uh better about like the care tips so um another thing that you might want to consider now now's a really good time to apply organic matter to your hydrangeas so organic matter keep in mind is very different than fertilizer uh fertilizer is going to you know feed your plant and make it want to start to bloom and blossom and you might want to hold off on that depending where you live so if you live in like a warm climate you might decide that now is a good time to fertilize. I always wait until I start getting more of that new growth. And I know that uh, those winter temps aren't going to start freezing again because I don't want to apply fertilizer, you know, now like in March, well, it's April 1st, and then have all this great, beautiful new growth and then have one of those zaps like Diane's going to have tonight in Michigan. I don't want to have a winter zap come and maybe weaken that new growth system. So I don't know, let me know how you guys feel about that. That's just the way that it works for me. Um, let me know when you start applying your fertilizers. I kind of wait till things warm up a bit and I start seeing a bit more growth. But you know, everybody's garden's different and this kind of hit or miss and, and guys experiment. Like a lot of times I will see like exact opposite advice given online, but if it works in your garden, it works in your garden. You gotta try, you know, different things and, and we need to fail at stuff and then, you know, get better at it, so. Uh, let's see what's going on here. Uh, Kevin said, hi, my Annabelle hydrangea started to get small buds in early April. Uh, new one. Very excited. Yeah. That's exactly what your Annabelle should be doing. So I have an Annabelle on my lap somewhere. Where are you? Annabelle, Annabelle. I had an Annabelle somewhere here. Oh, maybe I didn't. Let me think about this for a minute. Who's who, who's on my lap here. I've got my Nico endless summer. Oh, this might've been from the, I, I should have taken a better one from the Annabelle. Annabelle, you should be seeing uh, some uh, like little green, they look like leaf. Well, they look like these buds coming on it, but they're smaller. And Kevin, I'm really glad that you brought that up because everyone uh, has a different take on the Annabelle pruning. So here's the story. Annabelle's, like I said, come in on that new growth from the bottom of the plant. If you, you know, kind of hack it back, even if you don't hack it back, it's gonna come in from the bottom. I don't prune back my Annabelle's once again, because I'm super lazy, but uh, uh, even a better reason that I'm a little more proud of is because I've discovered that if I prune back my Annabelle hydrangeas and I have an experiment going this year, I prune back like three or four of them to like two feet, mostly because the deer got it, the bulk of them. So I was like, all right, let's just do an experiment for the flower tribe. We can kind of gauge the results together. So I wound up just like last week, cutting back my Annabelle hydrangea to about two feet of the ground, but only the three or four that were damaged by the deer. And I left the others intact. I think I have like another like 10 or 20 that I leave in place. And what I think is gonna happen, what has happened in years past, is that I find that the Annabelles that I cut back to the ground give me these gorgeous, crazy, like soccer ball size hydrangeas. They're like white and fluffy, colossal. Like people come and they're like, oh my God, this is like insanity. But the problem is since those um, stems came in on new growth, they're brand new and they're green and they're a little floppy. So you put this soccer ball size bloom on a floppy stem and you can imagine what happens when the rain comes. And so some years the rain will come in spring because Annabelle's are one of the first hydrangeas to bloom. So they're gonna come up, you know, like in the next couple of weeks, of, you know, like April, May. And what happens is they get like crashed to the ground because the stems just can't support that colossal bloom. But 
on the Annabelles that I decided not to trim back, what happens is you've got like that, that structure, you've kind of got like these, you know, like these stems in place from last year, you've got all these, you know, like wooded stems, you know, sticking up and they're kind of barren now. And like Kevin said, they're starting to have like some little green growth on them. They're all intact. So when the new growth comes from the bottom of the plant and it starts, you know, filling out and, and those, those, you know, hydrangea heads start forming, they have a support system. And what happens is they wind up staying in place when the rain and the wind come. And another thing that happens is their blooms are smaller because you didn't give it that recharge that I talked about before. So you didn't give it that recharge. So now the plant, you know, is worried about, you know, forming tons and tons and tons of smaller white, beautiful blossoms, and they're easier for the stems to support. So it's kind of a good idea to experiment uh, with your Annabelle hydrangeas. And the same thing happens with Incredible. Incredible is um, uh, like a, a newer variety of Annabelle and they are on sturdier stems. And I'm excited because Proven Winners is sending me some uh, Incredibles, um, I think, you know, like in, in the next couple of weeks. And we're going to do like maybe like a comparison. And, and Incredible has sturdier stems. So you don't even have to kind of worry about that issue if you have those. And, you know, we're going to kind of try those out and, and people just rave about them. So if you're looking for uh, a white hydrangea, look for Incredible. Uh, Annabelle, Annabelle's kind of like, you know, the old standard, but Incredible's like the newer, you know, like the new kid on the block. He's, they've been around for a while, though, I have to say. They've been around for a long time and, and people seem to love them, too. So that's my Annabelle story. Uh, let's see who else is here. Um, Oh, the deer. I know the deer. I don't know what to say about the deer. Besides, sometimes we just got to live and let live. I did uh, last last Thursday. We talked about like some deer deterrence. I talked about hanging Irish spring in like stockings around your hydrangea. We talked about like spreading cayenne pepper around them. I think the best deterrent that, you know, and this came from the flower tribe is to put like one of those automated sprinklers, the a motion activated sprinkler so that if you can, whenever somebody or some animal comes near your hydrangeas, it'll get sprayed by water. If you can do that for like, you know, now until everything warms up, that would be great because I find that once things start warming up, then the deer have like a whole variety of places they can graze from. But right now they're like super hungry because there's not much out there for them to eat. So they wind up in our gardens and I feel bad for them. They need to eat. But if you can, if, <laughs> I'm saying I feel bad for them. Meanwhile, I'm saying spray them with water. If you can give them that little shot of water, like a couple days in a row, chances are they're going to go someplace else uh, to look for food. Um, let's see. Houston, Texas, how are you? You think you have an endless summer, Daniel? One of them receives direct sun during the day. Should I have something to give? Oh, okay. He wants to know if um, you should do shade during the hot, sunny days. So if you want to have those beautiful, gorgeous blooms last you all summer long, it's a super idea to plant your hydrangeas in morning sun and afternoon shade, exactly what you're thinking, Daniel. I, um, you can't always do that, so you can kind of experiment. I've got some endless summer that are like spectacular. They, they actually bloom all summer long, and then they dry to like that beautiful like blue, purple dried flower on the stem, and, and I love them. And then I've got other endless summer that are in full sun and they don't get that afternoon shade and they kind of burn up and they're crispy and they're like, you know, after like a week or two, they're just like completely fizzled. So um, some people buy, they have like, it's almost like a cover. You can, it's almost like when you go tent, when you go camping and they, you put like a makeshift tent over them. I think it's called a gardener's block. Anybody know what that's called? They have them on Amazon. Um, so <laughs> what does someone say about Oh, Diane said, don't blame the, the deer for, for avoiding the Irish spring. I hate the smell. I know. Well, that's the idea when you do that with the, the deer. Like anything that's like super smelly, they, they kind of hate. But anyway, back to the shade issue. If you can't have some form of shade, that's great. If you find that the hydrangeas that you have planted in full sun keep burning up, you may consider maybe moving them in fall when they're dormant. Uh, maybe like moving them to a place that gets that morning sun and some afternoon shade to kind of protect it, especially if you guys live in like warmer climates, because that's going to be super important. And also keep up with the watering. That always helps. Um, I wanted to show you guys some other things here. You know what? Let me take a quick little little peek here. You grab a quick cup of coffee. You guys have your coffee yet today? <laughs> while, you're, while I'm taking a quick sip, let me know where you're from if you haven't yet. 
and put in any questions. Give me like a, a quick minute because I always have all these things I want to tell you about. And then when I'm done, I'm like, oh, why didn't I tell them about this? So let me take a quick look at my show notes here. Oh, my daughter Jill um, is doing a, a TikTok channel for me. So God bless you, Jill Lehman. <laughs> she put one up yesterday. So you can check that out. It's like all little scenes from the flower farm with music in back of it. And I'm telling you, these kids are like so crazy talented. Um, Oh, Sheldon was telling me, I mentioned him in our last live. So I'm trying to go live. I'm trying to go live every Thursday on YouTube. And if I can't go live, I'll at least, you know, post a video every, I'm sorry, every Thursday at 1030. And if I don't go live, I'll try to at least post a video there. And, you know, Sheldon kind of walked in like during our last video. And I was telling you guys about a great project that we did for our kids uh, when they were little and in case you missed it. So we have four kids and we try to keep them outside, like especially when they were little, like as much as possible. Cause like I said, you got to run kids like horses um, to get all their energy out and keep them happy. So we took one of our uh, tractors and we dug out this tremendous like sand pit. And when I was talking, I said, Oh, it was like a four foot by three foot foot, huge sand pit. And later on, Sheldon's like, hell, the sand pit that we dug out was like, was like 20 feet by like, you know, 15 feet. Cause we would have like all the neighborhood kids in there playing and you know, they'd have all their dump trucks and their Barbie dolls and they would play there for like hours and hours and hours. And we were talking about the sandbox because I was saying that to keep the cats out of your sandbox or your kids sandboxes or out of your gardens, they hate orange peels. They hate the smell of like citrus. So I was saying, you know, put some orange peels around there. But he was saying, you know, you told him that you, <laughs> that we had like a four foot uh, sandbox. Like imagine like eight kids sitting in a four foot area. So anyway, that was a little correction there. But that's a really fun project. If you have the space for it, even if you just do like a 10 foot or like a four, I don't know, like a six foot by what, whatever you can do, if you can kind of dig it out, especially next to like their swing set and get a whole bunch of sand from like Home Depot and just dump it in there. And then we put like little logs around it. So like, you know, the, the kids could sit there or the, the parents or, you know, whoever's out there, like, you know, just kind of shooting the breeze as they're playing. It's so fun. It's so fun. So we had like all these like chopped up logs all around it. I got to try to find video footage. And uh, we just left, you know, like a lot of the toys in there and they would just, they would live there like all summer long. So that's like a really, really fun project. So let me see what else here. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Oh, so guys, I have a free PDF download for you and I'm going to put it in descriptions below, but um, I, you know what? I didn't load it. I didn't preload it. I should have preloaded it in descriptions, uh, but this uh, live video, I'm going to keep live in case you miss some of it. I, I keep it up there all the time. I can then go back and kind of put these things in descriptions that I forgot to do before, but I made a free PDF download for you guys. It's called four must have flowers for your garden. And it's like my four all time favorite, easy to grow flowers uh, and kind of like a little bit about them, why I love them and why you might want to put them in your own gardens. And I will put that in descriptions below once I get to like reload this video. Sometimes it takes a little a bit, so maybe check back. And um, I'm also trying to come up with a uh, online flower course, hopefully that I can offer to you guys before Mother's Day. And it's going to be on how to create your own fresh cut flower garden. So I'm working hard on that, but we keep having, you know, just, you know, th life comes up, <laughs> like life happens, right? So we're working on that. But if you sign up to catch that free PDF on those four must-have flowers, it will also put you on a mailing list and that will keep you in touch with uh, this course that we're coming up with, hopefully for Mother's Day. And let me know in comments below or on the side if you're interested in receiving information on like this online course, because I'm really excited about it. If I could just, if I could just get the momentum and get it done, I would be super excited. But on that note, I would also like to know what flowers would you guys like me to discuss? If I'm doing a course, an online course uh, on how to create a fresh cut flower garden in your backyard, what flowers do you want me to talk about? What flowers do you want me to, to, to teach you about? Like, do you love uh, peonies? Are you in love with sunflowers? Tell me some of your favorites. And tell me some of your other garden challenges that you're having that you would like me to cover because I like to really tailor uh, these courses for you guys because, you know, you're the flower tribe. So <laughs> so it should be specially tailored because you're special. So um, let's see what else is going on here. We talked about deadheading. Remember, deadhead anytime you want. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. 
organic compost. All right, so yeah, now is also a good time. Got well now, not now. I would say when the fertilizers go down, you can change the color of your hydrangea blooms if it's a certain type of hydrangea. So like the endless summer are super easy to turn. Well, not super easy, but you there. It's possible to turn them from like a pink to a blue in most soils. You're just going to kind of you know work with some of the pH of the soil. So I'm going to make a whole video on that. Uh, but if you have like a limelight hydrangea or you have an Annabelle hydrangea, those, you know, white poofy ones, you, you can't change those colors. And I think it's, I'm not sure about the Nikos. I think the Nikos are pretty much true blue. Has anyone ever had uh, any luck with changing a Nico to pink? I don't know that that's possible. So I'm not sure. Um, I'm just trying to read some of these questions here. Boy, I wish I could read fast. So I need to take like a speed reading class. Oh, okay. Someone, so just, um, I'm going to say your name wrong. No, I'm not. I'm going to do it right. Maria's Moments USA. We just ordered hundreds of mixed daffodils and we learned so much from your video. Oh, thanks. Oh, guys, daffodils. Don't even get me started. Okay. So if you're looking to plant daffodils, I love daffodils. And, um, uh, dutchbulbs.com. They're a great company. They send me like all these crazy, beautiful bulbs each year. So they sent me uh, these daffodils. Uh, they're called double daffodils. Do you guys know about double daffodils? If you don't, please Google them or just look on my channel because I think I have a ton of uh, how to plant daffodils. You're supposed to plant daffodil bulbs in the fall and you know, they come up now. But if you find daffodils already in pots, like at your garden centers and, and whatnot, you could put them in the ground. But look for double daffodils. They're insane. They almost look like peonies. So they've got like these double, triple, quadruple uh, blossoms around them. They will blow your mind. So later on today, if you haven't seen them yet, like I said, you know, hop on the channel. I think I've got like how to, how to plant and care for daffodils. Check out that video and you're going to see these like peony-esque uh, daffodils that are just like so spectacular uh, and you love them. And they usually come back every year. And what's great is the deer and the rabbits leave them alone. They have something going through their, um, through their stems called lycorine. And it's actually a toxic um, like syrup that the deer and the rabbits and the squirrels hate. So if you want like an, an almost foolproof plant to put in your spring garden, daffodils are your, you know, your plant. And the same thing with alliums, those big poofy, like purpley Dr. Seuss flowers, they are awesome because they come from the onion family and they're gonna kind of keep the deer away. So um, yeah, I'm glad you brought up daffodils. Um, let me see who else is there from Maryland. Hey, desert flower from Maryland. Uh, you have what you're sure are Annabelle's. They turn the color of limelights. Yes. Oh, good. Quite good. I'm glad you brought that up. So are there Annabelle's or. Okay. So uh, desert flower said, hi, Kelly here in Maryland zone seven. We have what I am sure are Annabelle's. They turn the color of limelights when they're in bloom. So are they Annabelle's or limelights? Can you clear this up for me? Yes, I can. Okay. So. Annabelle hydrangeas and limelights both come in creamy, gorgeous white. I mean, they're they're unbelievable. Annabelles are super round. They look like softballs or soccer balls. They're super, super round. And the limelights are more cone-shaped. So it's almost like a triangle type bloom. It kind of goes up like this. Um, in the fall, they both turn green. Actually, Annabelle's turn green in the middle of summer. If you have Annabelle hydrangea and you have them planted in full sun in the morning and then afternoon shade, they are going to blow your mind because at the end of, not even the end of summer, at the end of like spring or the middle of summer, they're going to wind up turning this gorgeous, gorgeous emerald green and they're going to actually dry out on the stem, but they're going to stay intact. So you almost have this like pre preserved, like mummified, gorgeous green emerald round ball on your Annabelle hydrangea that you can even cut and turn it into a, uh, a semi-dried or a dried flower arrangement. And I have a video I made it showing you how to do that. The limelight hydrangeas will also turn this really gorgeous, unbelievable green color, but the limelight hydrangeas are going to turn that color in September. So they're going to turn like this beautiful green and the limelights also have like little specks. Sometimes they even have like, like um, maroon in them. So if your hydrangea is, so here's like one of those things, like if, if it's this, it's this, if it's, you know, like the logic game, if your hydrangea blooms super early in spring or like the beginning of summer and it has a beautiful round white ball, chances are it's like an Annabelle or an Invincible. 
And then it returns to that beautiful green towards like the middle of summer, the end of summer, well, towards like the middle of summer, then it's an Annabelle. If it is more of like that triangle shape, it's a limelight and it's gonna turn like beautiful white towards like the middle of summer, it's gonna be white and gorgeous. And then in fall, it turns green, then it's a limelight. So that's, I hope that's, you know, kind of an answer to the question. Uh, let's see. When does New Jersey's frost season end? Oh, hey, Krishna, good question. When does New Jersey's frost season end? Because I want to grow plants in my garden. Excellent question, so great. So New Jersey's like, you know, well, New Jersey's crazy. Um, you know, it's just, the weather can go up and down. I remember one Mother's Day, I think that we had snow like the day before Mother's Day. And it was so crazy because like some of the plants were in the ground and hey, Sean. <laughs> I was just saying how I forgot the size of our gigantic um, sandbox years ago. Lost them. Oh, oh, I am. <laughs> I said I was saying how like you said that we had that like tremendously huge sandbox and you were like, you know, it's not four feet. It was like, how big was that? Like 20 feet long? Yeah, I'd say it was like 15 by 15 feet. 15. Oh, I'm lying again. I told them I went from like four feet to three feet to like 20 feet. <laughs> <laughs> by 20 feet. Yeah, maybe 20 feet. Oh, was it? All right. He's saving me now. It was probably actually like 15 by 15 feet. So um, I come from- You have to be careful if you have cats. Yes, I love this. So Sheldon said, be careful because of the cats. So that was exactly what we talked about before. So throw some orange rinds in there. Um, oh, now I lost my train of thought. Oh, I hate, I hate these senior moments. Wait, someone just brought up something terrific. It was Krishna. Oh, the frost season. Okay. I wait to plant all of my direct seeds in the ground I wait until uh, like two weeks after Mother's Day. That's usually a safe bet for New Jersey. Um, some people, you know, will plant sooner and, you know, they'll, they'll get a jump on the season. I remember one year, it was like Mother's Day week. It was probably the, the Mother's Day I'm telling you guys about. It was that Mother's Day week. And I put in like, I think like a thousand sunflower seeds. We direct seeded them. We have like an earthway seeder. We direct seeded them into the farm. And I was so happy. And then like two days later, we had like this uh, snow and temperatures and they were horrible. And, you know, I think it was because of that, but I had like the worst crop. It was just horrible. And I, I just would have waited like just a little bit more. So I like to wait until temps warm up. Usually after Mother's Day is a good rule of thumb. However, if you're starting to see like certain plants that are in the garden centers now, talk to your garden center person, because, you know, a lot of these plants that are already like balled up, they're already in pots. It's okay to like plant them now. So it depends on what you're planting. If you're, if you're putting seed in the ground, wait till Mother's Day. But if you're putting plants in the ground, talk to like the person at your local garden center and they'll let you know if you can kind of put them in now because you know now might be a really great time to plant. I know I just, I actually put some stuff in, you know, I hope it was a good time. Sometimes I just get impatient and I, I start like throwing things around, which is a little haphazard, but most of the time it works out. Uh, Meredith from Toronto, Canada. Thank you for joining us. Let's see. So Kevin said, I meant, oh, okay. So Kevin's question before, so he said he meant to say he has a hydrangea that's shade in the morning and sun in the afternoon. I think it's okay. I have, I have hydrangeas that are like that. So most of the time you read, oh, put them in, you know, morning sun and afternoon shade. And if you have the reverse, but it's still getting like half a day of like, you know, it's, it's getting that, that shade in the morning, but then it's in bright sunlight. I mean, it should be fine. I just know that sometimes afternoon temps, especially in like, Kevin, did you say you were from Texas? Where are you from? I think in like those really Southern states, that afternoon sun could be super, super, super hot, uh, but test it out. I think as long as it's half and half, I don't think it's that big of a deal. Once again, like a lot of times you read all these tips online and you're like, God, I, I, can't, I, I can't keep up with all this. There's no way I, I, I can do all these things specifically. How can anyone ever keep a garden? You know, you have to do the best you can and then just kind of work with what you got. But I think, I think Kevin, that will be fine. I bet it'll be fine. Try it out. Uh, oh, thanks, Meredith. You like my shirt? Oh, oh um, this is, I got it in Target. Do you love Target? I buy everything in Target. So I think I bought my happy shirt in Target like four years ago. So, but thanks. <laughs> oh, I want to show you guys something really fun. So I love doing these lives because I have all this stuff around my house. I always have like a little planting project or a Gijimagoo that I'm working on or something that's, you know, someone showed me that I want to test out. And um, then I'm like, oh, I should make a video on this. And then I just never get to it. So instead of making a video on it, I'm just going to show you live because it's right here. So I bought this basil plant in ShopRite. I don't know, I guess like four months ago, you know, like you buy them in like the little sleeves and they've got like the little roots on the bottom, the little dirt 
you know, you buy like a little plastic bag. I bought it in the produce section and um, I put it in like this little, you know, like tumbler glass of water and I just have water here. I don't even have dirt in this cup. I just, I basically took it from the packaging and plunked it in here. Like it came with the dirt and everything. And it has been blooming for four months. So, I mean, you know, talk about saving money on herbs. So what I do is I'll give it a pinching. I'll kind of take the new growth that's here, like right in the middle. And I take my fingernail and I just pluck it off and I'll cook with that. I'm the world's like worst cook. So my, my friend Safar right now in Kuwait is probably laughing. But yes, I, I know I'm the world's worst cook. You tell me that all the time. So I am the world's worst cook. But when I do cook, I will use these basil. And what's going to happen is this. Uh, is going to shoot out more of these basil leaves. And so I do this all the time. Like every day I'll come in there. I'll even put this in like tea or I'll even kind of chew on it because it kind of gives me energy and it kind of tastes super fresh. But as long as you pinch your a lot of your herbs, uh, it's going to send off like more shoots and it's going to just keep blooming over and over. So I have this in my window. It's been blooming for four months. And I also put in like a little herb garden in, in a, a planter of mine outside my uh, driveway. No, I'm in New Jersey. You know, it gets super cold here in New Jersey. I put this little like edible herb garden all from ShopRite, you know, like little tchotchke herbs. I put them all in the dirt in say like the end of August, September. I put in thyme, rosemary. I put in basil, oregano, um, chives, like a whole like little, you know, culinary thing. And I put it in that pot in, you know, like the end of August, September. And it's still there. I have to say like this thing bloomed throughout the winter. I covered it a lot in the winter. Like I would put like a, just a little hefty bag over it and then take it off at night. But most of the herbs survived. It's also protected though. It's kind of like in a little alcove. So it had a little protection from the elements. But how cool is that? I mean, I had this little herb garden going all winter and it's, and it's coming back now. Some of the plants died. They didn't quite make it through like the end of the winter. But for the most part, like I, I love that. I think it's such a fun little tchotchke tip to know. Uh, so, oh, Kevin, you're in England. Gotcha. Cool. Very cool. Coffee with Kelly. Oh, that's funny. Truth of the matter. <laughs> All right. I want to show you guys another fun tip. Do you guys have flowering, uh, trees? So I am addicted to flowering trees. My neighbor, Ellen Kohler, I think I told you guys in one of the last live videos said to me like years ago, Kelly girl, how do you have this garden in this farm? You don't have any flowering trees. And I was like, what? So I dove headfirst into flowering trees and now we've got them all over the place. So these uh, poofy, gorgeous flowers are from an ornamental white pear. We've got a ton of these like lining our driveway. And what I did was I forced the blooms. So that means that I went out to these trees like, I don't know, like a week or two ago. And they kind of looked more like this. This is a different plant. I think this is a weeping cherry. And what I did was I cut them when they were in the stickly stage, but they had these little buds kind of coming out, like just these little green nubbies. And I kept them in water. I just plunked them right into water. And I put them in my house. I put them in like my den. And after two weeks, poof, like they exploded. So the trees outside don't have the blossoms yet. But since temperatures inside my house are nice and warm, these gals just like burst open. So if you want to do something super fun, if you have flowering trees outside, like ornamental pears, um, if you have forsythia, chances are they're already blooming. But if they haven't bloomed yet, like Diane in Michigan, yours might not have bloomed yet because you guys are still like a little colder than us. Go out, cut a whole bunch of those branches, put it in your kitchen. I will guarantee these things will make you giddy with excitement when they start like bursting open and everything outside is still like has no color. But your kitchen's like blowing up with all these colors. So I've got some like weeping cherry branches in here. You could tell they're going to start exploding open pretty soon. And um, I have these all over the house. Like every place you walk, there's like sticks. So it kind of looks like, um, it looks a little creepy right now. It looks like a Halloween house because I've got these giant sticks. And I mean, some of them I have, they're like 10 feet tall. Um, so you have to think we're also a florist here at Cranberry Fields. So like we would do like events with all these crazy things. So I bring all these like event flower pieces like in my house sometimes. <laughs> sometimes it looks kind of weird. So we've got like giant sticks everywhere, but they're starting to blow open and they're absolutely beautiful. So, so that's the other little trick for today. So, um, all right, guys. So I appreciate you guys uh, showing up. And like I said, I'm going to try to come live every Thursday at 1030. And the days that I can't be live, I'll make sure that I at least post a brand new video. And please keep your questions coming. Please, please uh, visit us over at the Kelly Lehman's Flower Tribe Facebook group and um, show me some pictures from your garden. I love to see uh, the successes, but I love to see the failures, I think, even more because I know how many failures I have in my garden and to kind of just 
uh, we can help you out with them. And it also, I think, helps us realize that, you know, it's, it's okay to make these mistakes in the garden. Like everyone's got these picture perfect gardens on Pinterest. I'm like, I should probably just make a Pinterest page on like what my garden looks like now. Like half of it's a disaster. The other half's overgrown. The other half, like, you know, parts of it didn't make it. So I think it's also fun to see like the blunders that people make and we kind of learn from each other. So check us out over there and uh, grab that PDF download uh, when I finally get it loaded on the back end. And um, yeah, so I guess, it, listen, I, I appreciate you guys showing up. So it's so fun seeing you guys. I will see you um, next Thursday, God willing, and have a great week. And I will see you guys in the next video. Now how to get out of here. Oh, here it is. Okay. Bye.